uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me for another episode of the Ross A. Bespoke Interviews with the Experts. Now, today we're going to look at music and specifically booking music for your event, whether that event be a wedding, a corporate dinner, whatever. Music's a big part of our life and we really want to get it right. So my expert today is Rich Gordon and he seriously is an expert because not only is he a highly experienced bagpiper, a saxophonist, I always have trouble with that one, a saxophonist and a guitarist, but he is in fact a, good, a composer as well. So when it comes to music, he knows pretty much everything. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rich. You're very welcome. And I have to say uh, what a privilege it is to be referred to as an expert knowing some of your previous musical clients. Well, yeah, I mean, I, you, are, you are, though. It, there's no doubt. I mean, I've worked with you a lot of times, and the quality of your work is absolutely um, fantastic. I mean, uh, and, and like I say, I'm comparing you like, to Quincy Jones and Bono there, so, you know, you're fantastic. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, like I say, Rich and I have done a lot of uh, events together and uh, very different things as well from VIP dinners to, to weddings. Um, and, you know, his, his combination of, of everything from very traditional Scottish bagpipes. I mean, honestly, if you've seen his regalia, maybe we'll put a photo on here. Because if you see him dressed up in his full piper gear, you, you're just going to love it. I know especially any Americans watching, they will... They would just want a big poster on their wall, no, no doubt. Um, and, you know, mellow, uh, mellow uh, jazz for your dinner, um, rock guitar, which I mean, I must, I've not seen you do the rock guitar, but I was look, looking on your website and very impressed with that. Um, you know, so, so you can do a bit of everything, really. Um, uh, I mean, it's, there's one thing, you know, that I, I've learned over the years is that the right music makes or breaks an event. Um, so, so what do you think is the most important thing uh, that people need to think about when they're organising live music? That's a very good question. Um, I, I think really up there would be knowing uh, the, the audience that you are entertaining. Um, you know, it's certainly something that I come up against at weddings more is that the bride and groom have very particular ideas about what kind of music they want. But then they often forget that at the times where they're asking for these things to be played they're often not around uh you know they're off getting pictures taken or whatever and you know you're, you're left sort of playing to a group there may be a small portion of this large room of full of people that appreciates the same kind of music as the bride and groom but it's kind of lost on the rest of them um so i i think that's that's very important and particularly you know when you mentioned about uh, uh dinner music uh especially um it's really important to know what's what's going to work for the people in the room certainly uh you know i'll give you an example was a couple of years ago i was playing for a tour group uh, up in inverness and uh you know the the organizer they wanted the full uh scottish bagpipe experience and uh over dinner so of course i played but um unfortunately it <laughs> Although it was a novelty for many people in the room, it was also a bit of an aberration for many because it's it's hardly a subtle instrument to play, uh, particularly in an enclosed space. And uh, you know, if looks could kill, I think uh, some people would have sent me home in a body bag. You know, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, absolutely, I think it's important to to choose um, the right approach for everyone in the room and not just you know uh, one or two particular tastes. Uh, I think largely because not everyone is there to listen to the music necessarily. Mm. Um, and, you know, you certainly don't want to, to spoil their experience uh, by not, not enforcing something on them. That sounds, that sounds really uh, nasty, but you know, um, if you're going to be there, you know, everyone has to, to be able to enjoy it themselves. So that, that's a really crucial step, I think. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I totally agree. And that, and that sort of leads on to what my, my next question was going to be, which is, you know, because, because, you know, we're both the same. We do a lot of different events. And, and, you know, I've seen you everything, as I mentioned, from corporate events and VIP dinners to weddings. And, you know, could you maybe give us some examples of, of what, what does and doesn't work or, or what sh people should look for? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so in terms of things that do work, um, I, you know, in terms of uh, 
let me think here. Try to think of the best example. I have so many to pull from. Um, if we come back to the, the concept of dinner music, certainly, uh, you know, I, I often, I, when I'm at weddings or, or even uh, other events where it's not a wedding necessarily, uh, I'm asked to play in the background generally, whether it's dinner is happening or it's drinks. Um, and that kind of environment works really nicely for, you know, something where you can get away with playing sort of mellow background music. Your, your, your goal there is not necessarily to stand out because you're not trying to engage with the audience in the sense that you want to, to, to G them up or you're not getting them to dance about like idiots. Uh, you're there as, as a background sound. And if, if it becomes too obtrusive into that environment, it can start to detract from the social experience that these people are actually having, you know? So if, for example, many times I've played at, uh, at wedding meals and, uh, you know, I never really do it on the pipes. It's not something that you can get away with on the pipes uh, for, for lengthy periods of time, certainly. Um, but I always, if I've done it on the saxophone or with the guitar, you know, it's always been sort of middle of the road kind of sound. Nothing with too many dynamic changes. Um, because again, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where you are interfering with conversation or people feel like they're competing against you. And like I said, you know, many people, they, they've come to an event, they don't, they're not there to listen to a musician, they're there to see their friends or they're there to enjoy the company. Um, and coming back to my example, when I was playing in Inverness as well, actually, one of the things that certainly didn't help uh, that evening was the, the room that we were in. Uh, it was the old station hotel. And it had this very grand ballroom and that's where the meal was being served. But acoustically, it was dreadful. Uh, everything that could have been wrong acoustically with that room was wrong. You know, it amplified all of the wrong frequencies from everything, not just the bagpipes. So um, little little sounds, you know, like someone scraping their chair or someone uh, with a piece of cutlery on the crockery. All these things were, were amplified and it just pulled all the worst things out of the Highland pipes. Um, I did have my small pipes with me, but unfortunately they couldn't compete with the din because they're, they were being lost in the sound. So really uh, that, that didn't work. Um, what should have happened was they should have had me uh, either before or after dinner when they were in a different space. And then they should have just been allowed to get on with their, their meal. Um, I, to be honest, I don't really know if anything would have worked in that room either, uh, regardless of, of how loud or quiet it was just because of the space. Yeah, I mean, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And bagpipes especially, they, they work well in certain scenarios, don't they? Mm, I mean, yeah. e even myself as an Englishman, when I hear, you know, the bagpipes sort of on, on a misty day from the tower of a castle, you know, it brings a tear to my eye. Um, mm. But when I'm stood right next to a piper in a very small sort of vaulted corridor, it brings tears to both my eyes and not <laughs> Uh, so you it really does just depend, doesn't it? Um, Absolutely, yeah. I, is that is that the hardest thing? You know, in, in my experience, getting dinner music right is so difficult because you've got to look at the volume, the style, what, what sort of songs are, are, are mm. being played. I mean, it's hugely impactful on the dinner and people's enjoyment. Um, so what, what, what would your best advice be for people that are planning a dinner and, and they want to get a musician? You know, what should they do? Um, well, certainly, I, I would come back to the, the first question and, and identify the audience. Um, you know, what, what kind of dinner is it going to be? And, you know, you, you know yourself, uh, Simeon, that we've, we've uh, been at all different kinds of dinner from um, very polite uh, affairs with lots of decorum to, you know, dinner is, is sort of a loosely uh, used description uh, where most of it is alcohol and there's very little food consumed. So I, I think that's definitely a very important part of it and you know how much how much uh of a of a uh, an influence on the atmosphere do you want the musician to have do you want it simply to be something which is a background noise that people can uh, not so much zone out of but you know you know it's not going to interfere with with what's going on because people aren't there to hear the musician they're there just to enjoy the food or do you want it to be a more of an interactive experience are you trying to change the energy from being a you know a relatively calm affair to 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 bring the energy up in the room to whatever's coming next, um, and obviously that's going to differ from from situation to situation, uh, and, and certainly I, I, again you know the the actual space that you're going to be in. I mean you've talked about uh, Turing Castle, obviously that's where we've done most of our work together. The dining room spaces in there they're 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 lovely, but they're also very small and compact. So anything uh, musically is going to be quite intense 
in that space, regardless of whether it's a soft instrument or a, or a loud instrument. Um, and I think that's really important to understand as well as, you know, factoring in your decision of which kind of musician you're going to have, again, what they're going to play, what your intended outcome is from the, uh, the entertainment for, for the night. Yeah, I mean, that, you're right, that's hugely important. And, and another thing that, that I'm going to throw in from, from the sort of the other side of it um, is when people are speaking to their musician and they're planning all this, they really need to get the people doing the catering involved as well mm. to, to be able to know what the musician needs to do and for timings and things like that. Because that's another thing where, you know, the musician and the catering side never want to be at loggerheads, but sometimes they end up at loggerheads just because you've mm. both got a job to do at the same time. And it can be a bit difficult. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, and I know where more so than at weddings. Hmm. Indeed, yeah, it won't be the first time that I've I've arrived at a, a, a venue to do a wedding, and uh, you know the, the coordinator has absolutely no idea of all the things that I've discussed with the bride and groom, or the, sorry, uh, the couple to be more inclusive, of course. And um, yeah, that that can often uh, present some 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 challenges. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've I've definitely had a few of those as well, and 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 it's it's difficult because as you mentioned earlier, the bride and groom have a very set idea of what they want the music to be i mean mm. there's something about weddings that they're just hugely musical aren't they i mean certainly um a, you know a british wedding a scottish wedding i just can't imagine it not having music I, i've not mm. seen one that doesn't um you know people feel very strongly about it as well um uh, wh why do you think that is why do you think it, it is so important um the music for people at a wedding um what do you think well, I, I mean, I personally, I feel that music is very much uh, an emotional experience. Um, you know, it's not, it's not just a job for me. It's not just something that I do. I, I feel very passionately about music. And there's a lot of things that I can, you know, I, I believe they call it synesthesia when you kind of confuse senses. Uh, and to me, you know, hearing a song uh, will immediately transport me back to a, a time or a location. You know, for good or for bad, of course, uh, mostly for good. So I, I think that music is fiercely important, particularly for wedding ceremonies, because it's it's a big day. You know, uh, the person who's coming down the aisle, this is their announcement into the room. Uh, they, they obviously have the privilege of being walked by their father or, you know, someone very close to them. It's a really intimate moment. And of course, you really want to make sure that you've got the right music for that. And it's something that they can look back on, um, hopefully, you know, uh, with, uh, with a very positive memories and say, oh, you know, that song immediately takes me back to how great that day was. And not just about the, the procession, obviously, when it comes to signing the, the, the marriage schedule as well, you know, making it official, you want to have the right kind of music for that. And, and later on the day, of course, we have, you know, the first dance as well. A lot of people elect not to do that, but uh, nonetheless, these are, these are, it's not just a random thing. This is something which is very much imprinted on that person's identity from then on. It's a, an important part of their history. So I, I can't imagine any wedding really not having any music. Um, I, and I would say that about 90% of all the couples that I play for, they, they always have very firm ideas about exactly what they want musically. Some, not so much, I think that they find the, the experience of being in a room full of people and being in the center of attention is quite intense. So they're not so fussed about that. They just kind of want something that is, is roughly in the right ballpark, but you know, they don't really have any strong feelings. So in that case, I'm often having to step in and say, well, you know, this works, that's quite nice. So on and so forth. But um, absolutely. No, I, I, I think music is a, is a vital part of the day. Um, above all, it's, it's one of the five senses ultimately uh, from the experience. So, yeah, I mean, you know, so so what do you think they should do to get to get exactly what they they want from the the musicians on the day? How and how should they go? And actually, I'm going to add a second part to that as well. Do they need to think about what their other guests are are liking, or is it just about the bride and the groom on the day, or not just bride and groom? Sorry, as we said, the the couple. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um. So to answer the first part of the question, uh, I think I think if it's something that you feel strongly about, you're you're going to have a a good idea about what you're looking for um, immediately. 
and you know that's that's obviously going to have a big bearing on on which musicians to approach um in uh obviously the 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 musician that you approach you know that they they're going to offer something that is is uh is important to you you know there are some fantastic singers for example that as we've all heard, they've done amazing cover versions of different songs, but they've they've made it their own because they have a very unique timbre to their voice. Or you may go the completely instrumental route, you know, uh, like on saxophone. Or uh, there's many great harp players out there, or string players. You may prefer that sound. Um, but I think the important thing is 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 uh, is staying true to exactly what you want. If you want the original recorded version, of course, that's that's entirely your thing. Um, if you you prefer to hear it one way or another, then absolutely. But you should make sure that the musician that you're going for can actually achieve that, uh, because there's there's no going back. You know, this isn't uh, it's not a studio session. It's a, it's a live take, and uh, unfortunately, you can't get to the end of the aisle and go, oh wait a minute, he made a mistake. Right, I have to go back to the top and start this again. You know. Um, so I I think uh, when it comes to choosing music for the ceremony certainly it's it's important to engage with the musician that you've chosen very early on um, and that you're, you're very clear about your expectations and obviously you you want to ensure that that person can deliver on that um you're gonna to have to remind me the second part of your question because it's gone out my head um well you've to be fair you've answered the first and the second part because the second part was about you know people um uh, should they choose it for other people or just for themselves and you've definitely i see that. yeah I did have a second part to that though. Ah. Yeah, so I, as far as the ceremony is concerned, it really is all about the couple. Um, and it's all about making sure that, you know, these are memories that you're gonna have because it's your moment. But I think in terms of providing entertainment for the rest of the guests uh, for the other parts of the day, you know, whether it's the drinks reception or it's dinner or uh, obviously into the evening reception. Yeah, again, with evening reception, there's gonna be a few dances that are very specifically about the couple. And of course, that's your moment again. but. You know, just remember, you've got anywhere from from 30 to 150, 200 uh, other people who they probably want to have fun as well and, you know, different age groups. So it's important to find the right balance for the rest of the entertainment for the day. Yeah, I mean, that's it. You've got, I think they've got to, you know, it has to be realistic. I mean, if someone, say someone has a great love of Sepultura and Pantera, that doesn't necessarily make the best dinner music. Um, unless like someone can do it on the harp or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you can't really imagine Granny Genie getting up and, and headbanging to that. No, uh, no. Yeah, well, I'm generalizing, of course. There may be someone you like never that. Know, actually. <laughs> 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 I've seen a few. Um, so, I mean, we're, um, you know, I mean, but that is the beauty of music, isn't it? It's such a leveler and it's something that almost everyone, I know that you do get, the very very rare person who just make the statement they don't like music but that's mm. that's so rare it really sticks into your head you're, you're kind of like what not any music but um it generally everyone likes music not all the different genres etc but i mean i know from looking after like, as we mentioned earlier a lot of different musicians in the past and and once they get talking about music to you that it's it's everything else sort of goes out the out the window because that's that's mm. the passion and i i know having some amazing evenings sat down with with quincy jones um when you know everyone else had gone to bed and it was just me the butler and him i mean i am the butler but you know what i mean me the butler and him um, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> just to clarify that uh, and um you know he'd be telling me all these stories about you know the the rat pack and all this kind of thing and he told me about how hip-hop was actually invented in the 1920s something i never knew and you know jazz and it's amazing but because of that music he just opened up to me and just chat because i wanted to hear and and he wanted to speak mm. and, and and that's what I, I i love about it i mean what what do you think is the best thing about your job as a musician that's that's the million dollar question really isn't it um i mean i i think to be honest the best thing about my job is the fact that i do what i love doing and it doesn't always feel like a job uh i mean obviously there's an element of repetition about it um and that's going to be the case with any job but nonetheless uh, it's something that i've chosen to do and and i have the privilege of doing it and that's you know i i've, I've come from a background of working full-time in, in various jobs and I just didn't get it. 
the money was always great, but I, I didn't I didn't get the point of going into doing something that I wasn't particularly sold on. Mm. But in this job, you know, it, it's admittedly this this year has has proven that maybe it's not always the sensible choice. Uh, but um, nonetheless, I wouldn't change it for the world. You know, it's it's uh, it's just it's just a real privilege to to be able to to do what I, I do passionately and. Um, there are other aspects to it as well. You know, there's the there's a very sort of creative side that comes with it. Um, not so much with with playing the bagpipes. The bagpipes is a very staid kind of instrument where you can't really deviate from from how it's done. Um, there's not a, lo a lot of freedom of expression there, but you can freestyle it more. And I, I hate to use that term freestyling. Uh, it makes me feel so pretentious, but uh, certainly as a sax player, you know, you you can you can mix things up a bit. You can kind of interpret things in your own way. You can add your own little flair to them. Um, and, you know, and, and doing the job as a, certainly as a saxophonist, uh, you know, I, I go from one, one extreme of kind of playing gentle jazz music to the other extreme of playing alongside a DJ. And often when I've done the stuff alongside a DJ, you know, some of it's, this is the first time I've actually heard some of the stuff, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, I, that's not really my background in that kind of music, but literally right there in the moment, that's the first time I'm hearing a particular piece of music and I'm expected to play along with it. So in that split second, you've kind of got to figure out, well, okay, well, what key are we playing in? What is the feel of this tune? And it's daunting at first, but it's also really exciting because um, it's just, it just forces you to use your musical knowledge and suddenly just bring something out and just kind of go with it. And it can be quite liberating as well. So definitely the just, being able to do what I love is, is the greatest thing. I think the second greatest thing and a very close, uh, I know you didn't ask this, but um, you know, it's hard to tell what would be greater sometimes, but it's just the opportunity to go to places that I wouldn't otherwise have gone to. Mm. You know, I've been to so many small places up in the Highlands of Scotland, uh, I've been in the middle of Glencoe, you know, been on Sky. I've been, I actually, I, I went to Greece a few years ago for my sister-in-law's wedding. I would, I would never have gone there had I not been a musician or of course not being married to her sister um but you know you know what i'm saying that these aren't places that i necessarily seek out but I've, I've had the opportunity to do that and you know that's that that's great and something that i really miss at the moment is just getting to, to travel about and just kind of see all these little places so yeah well i always saw you you popping up all over i mean following you on um like instagram and stuff is, is always is great because you just see you like having these great photos all over the place and and this kind of thing. I mean, you know, what's your what's your is your handle again on there, just so people can find you to follow you because it is great. Oh God, now you're going to ask me. Uh, so um, I'm going to have to spell this one out, but it's basically it's it is short for Rich Gordon Music Company, but it's R G M U S I C O M, R G Musicom. Right. Well, I'll make sure I put that in in the in the notes underneath as well, because I would highly recommend people to follow you because just because it's fun, you know, you, you see photos of you, you know, and anyone who's is into seeing like the the I mentioned the regalia with the bagpipes and and Rich does that really well. Look, look, look at this. Look at this. This is this is this is my, this is the feathered bonnet. I don't have the rest of the kit with me just now, but this is uh, this makes me a foot and a half taller. Yeah. I mean, it generally, it, it does its job. I mean, they were invented by Napoleon, weren't they? To make his troops look properly scary by making them look super tall. And, and, and it, it, it does the job. You're quite a, a sort of imp impressive figure when you're stood there like that. Well, you know, I don't like to brag. <laughs> no, no, but I, I agree. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm very average height, but uh, somehow putting on the outfit just seems to make me look bigger than I actually am. Uh, you know, unless unless you happen to be standing next to six foot seven tall men who who dwarf you even in the outfit, then you feel really small. Uh -huh. Like, yeah, if you ever did like a thing for the LA Lakers or something, you'd still look like some tiny guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a there was a Canadian uh, family came over a few years ago. Uh, I did an elopement for them, and and I, I stood posed with the three groomsmen, and they were all all taller than six foot five. And uh, I, I think for the groom alone, the top of that bonnet only came up to his shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> it was like day of the Triffids, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, so uh, well, we, we actually, we, we mentioned your, your Instagram account, but, but in general, I should say, if anyone needs to book you or needs advice, you know, how, how's the best to go about that? The best way to find me, actually, I always try and encourage people to go to my website because, um, 
in terms of social media, at least as far as Facebook's concerned, I kind of have three different uh, pages there for the different areas of music that I play. So the uh, best place to go is the website. It's all in the one place there, and it is www.rgmusicom.co.uk. Um, you could probably just search for Rich Gordon, Scotland, and I will come up. Uh, if you don't remember that, have a look on Facebook. Uh, the easiest one to remember is Kilted Sax. That is the name of my saxophone act. Soon to be trademarked. Exciting news. That's impressive. Uh, yeah, well, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the lockdown has put a, a break on that for now, but uh, hopefully that'll be coming soon. Anyway, uh, I believe I am the only Kilted Sax on Facebook, so um, there can't be too many idiots with the same name there. <laughs> that was fantastic. Um, so, uh, uh, are we going to be able to uh, uh, play the people some of your some of your music? Uh, yes. Would you like? What would you like? What, anything. 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 I, know it's all good. I know it's all good. You know, I've heard a lot of it before, and I know it's all good. <laughs> well, you know, we'll keep it nice and traditional, and we'll we'll, we'll do some 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 pipe playing. Uh, now, actually, I'm I'm, I'm going to cheat here slightly. These aren't these aren't acoustic bagpipes. These are electric bagpipes, but it's easier with the microphone set up. So, I never knew there was such a thing. Fantastic piece of equipment. Uh, actually, the guy lives in Australia now. His name is Murray Blair. Um, these are his bag. These are electronic bagpipes, and they they use sampled bagpipes rather than synthesized bagpipes, so they sound more realistic. Brilliant. Something not especially romantic about cutting them off with a foot switch rather than a, a nice, graceful <laughs> loss of air, but uh, you get the picture. Yeah, beautiful. I'll give you a little, uh, get everyone to applaud at home, please. There we go. Uh, you, you obviously, you, you touched on the, the, the part that I, I, well, at least I try and call myself a composer. Um, maybe I talk about that for a little bit? Please, please do, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, um, it was actually, it's never been especially my ambition to, to, to work in the, uh, in, the, in the musician for hire field. Uh, not that I don't enjoy it, but you know, that, that was not the, that's not really the big dream and that certainly wasn't why I started out doing all this. Um, actually, uh, the, the, the primary driving force in doing that was that I could spend my days making money from music so that I could pursue the more, more artistic side. And uh, that's one of the, the lovely things that this lockdown has actually given me the opportunity to do is to take a little bit of time to go back to kind of revisiting some of the music I'd already written and 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 giving it the, the, the treatment that it needed um, to, to achieve the vision. It's wildly different uh, from, from playing uh, traditional music on the pipe, certainly. Um, you know, one of my he heavy influences is uh, guitar players like Joe Satriani, Steve Vai, um, and as a result of discovering their music and kind of getting into the guitar, that's actually what led me to to appreciate more broader forms of kind of jazz and blues and bringing that into the, the fold of the saxophone and kind of getting away from, you know, I learned the saxophone in high school. It was always about doing exams and mostly focused on kind of classical pieces, which were, were challenging and, and, and there was a certain level of enjoyment, but it's not really where my heart lay. Um, so I kind of find it's all come full circle now and I'm finding ways to, to bring all the three of the instruments together in, in either uh, a field of uh, being a musician for hire, but also in the artistic side as well. So uh, that's something I very much want to explore more of over the coming years. Now that I feel like I've established myself, um, you know, I'm going to refer to that as the day job now, of course, because uh, that is the day job. That's the thing that pays the bills at the moment. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm... I feel uh, I feel reinvigorated now um, that I can 
kind of try different things out now with these different instruments and all these, all these wonderful toys that I've acquired over the last few years as well as a result of doing this. So, yeah. Well, you're sitting in front of quite an impressive backdrop of, of equipment and instruments there. It's pretty impressive. Uh, yeah, well, you know, uh, that was one of the benefits of having a student loan. <laughs> Brilliant. So, um, so, so there's another. So, if people want to hear your music. It's on your your website, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, do you also have something like a, a YouTube channel that um, that has some bits on, or? I, I do. Yeah. Um, no. The, the the question is the thing is I set my YouTube channel up long before I had a semblance of of branding. So, um, probably the best thing to do would be to just go. A website there are various youtube videos there and there's a link to youtube at the top that you can you can find it there and there's a variety of, of videos of all different kinds of things there so yeah so i'm just thinking people are watching this on youtube so it's going to be one they're going to have it on the screen right now and they could just click it so as well oh YouTube. i see right okay uh well in that case simon shall i just send you the link to my youtube channel and, on, and then you can... we'll put it on the comments and then um, they can go straight to it because they're going to be hungry to see yeah. it they're going to watch this and they're going to want to see it aren't, aren't you everyone watching you want to see it don't you well so of you course they're, they're only human you know <laughs> fantastic well well thank you thank you so much for um what has been a really lovely interview to be honest I've, I've really enjoyed that it's you know most of my interviews tend to be very much um industry based in my industry so this was nice to step slightly to one side to talk about something a little bit different but equally helpful um so thank you so much for joining me you're very welcome it's been an absolute pleasure as always Thank you. Um, so anyone who enjoyed that interview with the expert speaking to Rich Gordon, please make sure you subscribe to the uh, Ross Ada Spoke YouTube channel because we've got loads more interviews to come from an interesting and diverse group of people. And I really look forward to seeing you on the next one. So from me, Simeon Rosse and Rich Gordon. And it's a goodbye from him. <laughs> goodbye from me. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>